Uh, okay, so uh, how many of you were here two weeks ago when I did this? Pretty much everybody. Okay, good. So just to remind you what we were trying to do here, which looked where we are, because I hoped to get that done last time as well, but uh, I spent more time than I anticipated. This is just a snapshot of what's going on right now in global markets around the world where various things are traded in a market, just like a market, a corner store market. Uh, and here we have, and since two weeks ago, the Dow Jones has risen significantly, right? So that the US stock market has uh, gone up, the global Dow, let's see what, so there, yeah, that's this rise that was happening since I last saw you right there. Uh, go to the global Dow, if you would, for a second. But let's see what's happened to uh, world stock markets. Remember, this is slices of ownership in companies, and this would be companies all over the world, and it would be, therefore, a fair reflection of how investors think those companies are going to do in the future, how much profit those companies are going to make. If you have a share of the company, you have a share in those profits, at least theoretically, and if the company's worth more, your share is worth more, if the company's more profitable, it will be worth more. And here's the global Dow, and the global Dow, where this is, oh, this is today, we don't want one day. No, well, no, let's just do, uh, oh, this is a year? No, that's, that, oh, that's a year here. No, we want the la just the uh, uh, last 10 days, that's great. That's just since I was here last. And, uh, and so they've been, where are they? Uh, uh, here we go. So that's one year. I think you uh, you went to some. All right. So there. Oh, there it is. Uh, so we were. So it was. Oops. Going. All right. So here we go. And we were. We're in October. It was. Uh, so we were going down, down, down. And then there's been this rally everywhere. Except anybody know uh, who got hit super hard this weekend? What? What? country stock market, maybe here from Brazil. Brazil got, the stock market in Brazil was down 10% yesterday, at least last I looked. <clears throat> Why? What happened in Brazil, anybody know? Uh, there was an election, and did the sort of left-wing, more populist candidate get re-elected, or did the opposing, more business-oriented candidate get elected? You know? The left-wing candidate, Rousseff, the, president, the current president, got re-elected, very close vote, 40, 51, 48, 51 and a half, 48 and a half, I think. Um, and so why would the stock market go down if that happened? Anybody? Why would the stock market go down if that happened? You suppose. Just guess. Left-wing candidate gets re-elected, stock market goes down 10%. What's going on? <clears throat> yeah, please. Um, because the business uh, presidential candidate would have, right, would have theoretically gotten better with the economy. So yes, that's the assumption. <clears throat> As opposed to sharing it with poor people, it would, he would encourage the businesses. The businesses that therefore become more profitable, therefore your share in the stock of those companies would be more valuable, stock market goes up, right, in anticipation of that. In fact, what happened is the left-wing candidate got re-elected, and therefore there's a discouragement on the part of investors who think that taxes will go up, that uh, more of the money will be shared with poorer people, and so forth, and it won't be as valuable to own share of the stock. Okay, so back to the main thing, if you would, Lorraine, to the main picture there. <clears throat> so that's what's been happening, but again, it's in general, They've been going up from two weeks ago, so there was a kind of a panic in the world about the future of the world economy, which would affect the profits of all companies, right? China slowing down, for example, not buying as much, uh, therefore the companies that sell to places like China would be less profitable, therefore the shares of the stock would be less profitable. Uh, and there, the stocks have all been rising. Uh, the euro has gone up a little bit. Well, let's not get into all these, but again, this is a market of currencies which suggests to you what's happening to the relative values of the currencies in these countries, which gives you a, a sense of how pessimistic or optimistic investors are about those com 
countries because if you're gonna if you're optimistic about a country, you'll want the currency of that country, right? You figure China's I, I have a bunch of Chinese rented the people's currency is what they call it. <clears throat> and I have a bunch of them at home. I bought them when I was in China and they were they were eight to a dollar, now they're six to a dollar, and so those very pieces of currency are worth 25% uh, more than they used to be, right? So it's holding Chinese currency, not very much of it, I grant you, but, you know, a little bit, and that rose in value. But, of course, if I'd been holding dollars in China, that would have gone down in value, and that's what the currency market is telling you. And the futures are telling you, well, what's happening here to the price of crude oil, for example, well, that's still at 81, that's down from about 100, hmm, I don't know, a month ago, something like that. Well, that suggests that either there's lots and lots of oil in the world, lots more oil in the world than people used to think, and suddenly they come to realize it, right? So the value of oil would be less than you thought, and that's a reasonable story because of shale oil in the United States, North Dakota, places like that. Uh, the other possibility is that the world is going to slow down, China particularly, big buyer of crude oil, and so there'll be less demand for the oil. And therefore, the price would go down. And remember, there's tremendous speculation in these markets. Every minute, you can see these prices are changing. Millions of investors, or hundreds of thousands around the world, making bets every second of the day based on the latest news and so forth. And so you can have, and in the short term, do have these dramatic swings, which are based on the psychology rather than on what we're called the fundamentals, the underlying values of, of these things. I have a piece on the news hour tonight. I don't know what it must run here. I don't know what channel. What's PBS channel here? 13, I think. 13 you, for me. You get 13? Okay, well, you know, where Sesame Street is and stuff like Well, that's where my show is at 6 o'clock. Uh, and tonight I'll have a story on Ebola and the chocolate prices. The price of cocoa, which is the raw material in, uh, in uh, chocolate, is uh, spiked dramatically about a month ago, went up, uh, I don't know, 10, uh, 20 percent, something like some huge drop, jump. Why? Because the Ebola stories were getting more uh, currency and were out there more. Uh, Ebola, Ebola obviously comes is located in West Africa. Uh, that's where most of the world's cocoa comes from. And suddenly there was this fear of, oh, there won't be enough workers who will come into West Africa to harvest the cocoa, right? Because they'll be afraid to. Maybe there's something tainted about the cocoa itself. There was this anticipation that there would be less cocoa. Here we're coming up to Halloween in this country, and then, and then the Christmas holidays, the, uh, you know, winter holidays, and then uh, even Valentine's Day and Easter, and oh my goodness, there's going to be a shortage of cocoa. We anticipate that there will be a shortage, therefore we'll buy it now, thinking the price will go up, and the price shot up. It's now down back about 10% as those fears had lessened. Well, it's not likely that the fundamentals of the cocoa market changed much in that period of time. It's the market psychology follow, and that's what you can watch. The story tonight is about eight minutes, six minutes long, not really long. Uh, okay, so that's all of these. So now we get to the one that I had promised at the beginning, which is to say, debt, government bonds, because bonds, here's a bond, here's a bond from, they don't make them like this anymore, <laughs> this is 100 years old, uh, this is a bond for uh, Russian bonds, it's written in Russian here, it says obligatia, what do you think that means? Obligation, Obligation right, it's the same word, uh, this is a bond for 20 um, uh, pounds sterling, this is 20 pfund uh, sterling, for Sterling, and this is the Keishan Railway Company, but they put it in English because, of course, the investors are not going to be in Russia. They're going to be in the West even 100 years ago. Okay. And the bond is simply, hey, give us 20 pounds Sterling. Lend us the money. We'll give you the bond. This is the IOU. And on the back, uh, you clip the coupons. See those little, the, these things? Can everybody see that? There, this is actually clear. This is a Chinese bond. You can see the coupons here, right? So you, uh, this is there was a phrase called coupon clippers. Is somebody who just lived off their bonds, their their lending of money to companies or countries in this case, 
Uh, but they, well, this is, I guess, is a company. This is the Tahitian Railway Company. This is the actual Chinese government, as you can see. Okay. So this is a China bond from 100 years ago. It was a Russian bond. And you click the coupons. You just click those little are, uh, rectangles. And you send them in every six months. And you get the interest on the bond. And this, the interest rate here is 4.5% in 1912. And it goes all the way until 1920-something uh, or other, I think. 1922, I think, is when it was, maybe. Uh, and you can see the coupons were clipped. And then, uh, give away a punchline here, this is a 1918 uh, staple there. Big fat thing, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll pass it around so you can take a look at it. And that coupon right here is, clip, is stapled back onto the bond. <clears throat> so August of 1918 was when you were supposed to send, send it in. What happened in 1918 in Russia? Russian Revolution. The communists took over. Communists said, we are not going to honor the debts of the old king, the czar of Russia. Forget it. <laughs> so this person said, well, I'm not going to send in my coupon. It's not going to be, I'll just hold on to it. When, you know, eventually the communists, there was a civil war going on. If the communists lose, then the king, the czar, will come back in. He'll then maybe pay off the debts. I'll be able to send it, this and clip the rest of them and send them as well. Right? Uh, didn't happen, and so this, I bought this for, I don't know, $20. It's a collector's item years ago. So it's not worth what it was. And by the same token, here we have the Chinese bond. Well, I'll get to the Chinese bond. Anyway, you, you get the idea. That's what a bond is. Okay? Uh, so these are government bonds. Therefore, these are bonds that are issued by governments, not a rail, the railway company, but the actual governments themselves. And here we have the U.S. bond, 10-year, what do you think 10-year means? Yes? The maturity age, that is when you get the principal back. So in this case of this Russian bond, it was 1922, you get your 20 pounds back after having sent in your, you know, your uh, coupons for your interest payments. Right? Everybody file, and that's how any bond works. So that's how any loan works, right? A mortgage. You're paying it off, and eventually, of course, the mortgage date you, with a mortgage, you're also paying off some of the principal as you go, right? You're killing off the principal. That's where the word mortgage comes from, mort, as in debt, uh, Baltimore, or Baltimore, uh, same word. Uh, but uh, then there's interest-only loans, right? And these are interest-only loans. So at some point, 10 years in this case, 20 in that, Chinese one is 47 years. Uh, it comes to so now. What's the yield? What is the yield? Can everybody see that? Anyway, over there is something called the yield. It says 2.284. What is that? Anybody know what the yield would be? What, what do you expect? What do you suppose the yield? What, what do you think the yield? Yes, you sir. The, the interest rate, right? That's the coupon rate, or you know, this, the same rate as is on this coupon. We'll pay you, the United States government says, give us your money. We'll give you an IOU, a bond. We'll give you the money back in 10 years. And meanwhile, for those whole 10 years, we'll give you 2.283% interest per year. Okay, if you bought a bond, a U.S. bond today, this is actually, I don't want to get too confusing here, complex. This is actually what that bond is paying at if you sell it to somebody else. So if you've got the bond, let's say from a, this is a U.S. bond, not a government bond, and it's electronic now, you don't have these fancy pictures and beautiful, you know, uh, collectible items anymore. But you've got, a, you've got the ownership of a bond that you want to get the money for yourself right away, you can sell it to somebody else. So you sell it to them at a price where the interest rate is going to be effectively 2.83%, 2.283%. I, I can explain to you how the relationship between the price and the interest rates work, but let's, let's save that. Maybe I'll get to that when I show you a physical bond uh, again. So right now, 
That's what the U.S. 10-year rate is. Here's what the German 10-year rate is. Less than a percent. You're getting, you're getting what you get at a bank. What do you get at a bank nowadays if you put your money in a bank? Less than one percent. Well, there you go. So there, and look at Japan. If you buy one of their 10-year bonds, you're lending the money, right? To Japan. Japan is paying you less than half a percent a year, and then we'll pay you back the money in 10 years. Now, before we... Yes, please. Is there a difference between the green lettering and the red lettering? Mm. Red means it's going down. Green means it's going up. That's all. I didn't know if it was like a negative. Uh, well, it is, and you see the minuses next to the reds, right? Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I don't know why, why the Japan the lower right is red, that I, but you can see everywhere else with the, where's the minus sign. And, and I guess red would mean, well, I, I, I uh, yeah, the red is always minus, and so I, is that a red of the, no, 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 it would be minus, no, it's not negative, it's, it's positive, you're getting, uh, I don't know why that particular one of the corners red. Generally, it's going down, green is going up. Obvious, obvious reasons. All right. <clears throat> Let's stand back a moment from the market. I was orienting us toward where we were the last time. This is the bond market. We'll get back to it. But when you think about debt in general, and this would be in your own personal lives as well as a country's debt or a company's debt, if you remember nothing else from what I'm telling you, Remember this, if you will. It doesn't matter how much money you borrow. It's what you do with the money. Because the whole idea of debt is <clears throat> that you borrow, I mean the economic idea, is that you borrow so that you can do something productive with the money so that you'll be able to pay it back. Think of a farmer. A farmer can't exist without debt because the farmer has to pay the money to plant the seed with the crop coming sometime in the future. Or from your point of view, in the timeline, sometime in the future, over here. So the farmer has to borrow the money to make the investment, the seed, for the eventual payoff, which the farmer can't actually know because he doesn't, she doesn't know what the prices are going to be out there, right? But the whole idea is you borrow so that you can invest, so that you'll make enough to be able to pay back the interest and eventually the premium and you'll be ahead of the game. So the, the crucial thing to understand about debt, just as a fundamental economic concept, or just a concept, is that it's something to tide you over <clears throat> while you engage in the process of earning more so you can pay back the debt. So you all are here at Gateway, and you're paying something. It's costing you, at the very least, even if you're here for free, it's costing you what you would have made if you were working a job at, say, minimum wage. Right? That's called the opportunity cost. The cost of the opportunity you're giving up in order to be here, right? That's worth real money. So, at the very least, you're paying that in anticipation of getting a better job or a raise at your current job, right? You're investing in yourselves. In economic terms, your human capital. So there's, you know.